yourself a cold one. They strike them, huh? And listen to Russ Tucker break down the top college prospects on another tasty edition of The College Draft. Yeah, it is Daddy Soda time here on the College Draft Podcast presented by DraftKings, America's number one rated sports book app. They've got a ridiculous offer, by the way, with the NBA playoffs starting. I'll tell you a little bit about that a little later. I am so fired up as we continue this draft series of breaking down every team's draft. I'll never understand, and I'll probably say it every week, why we spend 50 weeks a year leading up to the draft and like two days afterwards discussing it when it actually happens. That's poor. That's not right. We should dissect these teams' drafts more than we actually do. I am Ross Tucker, former NFL offensive lineman, five teams, seven years, at Ross Tucker NFL on all the social media platforms. All of the shows are at Ross Tucker Pod. Uh, We do have an awesome YouTube page you should absolutely check out because you see the highlight clips of all of our shows. So if you don't know if you want to listen to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast or even Money or Fantasy Feast or whatever, you can just see the highlight clips. See whether or not it's worth listening or watching the whole thing. Speaking of YouTube, that is where my co-host first became a star. His name is Emery Hunt. He's F-Ball Game Plan on Twitter, Football Game Plan on YouTube, footballgameplan.com slash 2021 draft guide. You can still get it. You can Now that you know which guys are on which teams, you can see – Emery's thoughts on all the guys, including the undrafted rookie free agents, because nobody knows more about those guys than Emery. And nobody really knows more about FCS football than Emery. I mean, Emery and Craig Haley, those are like the two dudes that know a lot about FCS football. Before we dive into the AFC North, Emery, I got to get your thoughts on the FCS championship game yesterday. Man, what a fantastic finish that game was. And a lot of big plays. Uh, back and forth, and it started to get exciting once it stopped raining. Uh, it was exciting early on, but we had that hour and 15-minute delay. But toward the back end of the game, third and fourth quarter, it went back and forth. And you know, even though Sam Houston State won the national championship, how impressive was the true freshman running back Isaiah Davis of South Dakota State, Missouri Player of the Year, no offers from the state of Missouri, goes to South Dakota State and becomes an instant star in that title game. I thought he really closed out the game with that 85-yard touchdown run, but Sam Houston State had something else in the bag, and they went down the field with ease, honestly, and scored the game when it touched out. This is a fantastic game. Yeah, so a couple thoughts. One is um, I'm so glad they got to play this spring. I'm so glad they had the tournament and the championship game. I kind of wish more people were aware of it and had watched it, and uh, I don't know that they did a great job marketing it, or making sure people knew that awesome college football was on this spring. But it is what it is. I will say this. South Dakota State's quarterback and running back are both true freshmen. Like, it's crazy. I mean, and that running back, that long run, the stiff arm, I mean, some of the moves he made, that was so impressive. I have a feeling South Dakota State will be back in some way, shape, or form with those two guys both being true freshmen. The other thing that jumped out to me, Emory, I guess, is just the fact that Sam Houston State, all their games were one-score games. They were <laughs> all clo- – like, they they barely beat Monmouth. They barely – you know, all – it's, it's not like they were – like, a lot of times North Dakota State or whoever or JMU, they'll, like, roll through the first few teams and then get to the semifinals or the finals. Sam Houston State, every game was a, a competitive game. Yeah, they needed the pressure on for them to function. And you're right. You think about it. North Dakota State, Monmouth, uh, last week against GMU, they needed every bit of 60 minutes to beat those teams. And so this was normal for them to be down in the championship game, need to score to win. And it was just like, all right, this is like the first drive of the game. They marched down the field with ease and converted, I want to say, three fourth downs with the last one being the game with a touchdown. So it was just a remarkable effort by that football team. That's a total display of mental t- 
toughness. That's just amazing that that team can hone in and really hunker down and get the job done. Speaking of toughness, one of the teams that's been tough for a long time, it's the Baltimore Ravens. One of the reasons why they're tough is because they typically do a really good job drafting. They get volume. They get guys that play like a Raven. And I don't think this year was any different. You look at the Ravens, they went as Rashad Bateman, um, Odafe Owe, who was in college, was went by Jason Owe, uh, Ben Cleveland, the guard from Georgia in the third round, Brandon Stevens, a corner from SMU, Tylen Wallace, the wide receiver from Oklahoma State in the fourth round, Sean Wade, who, listen, I'm not hating on him. I'm just, this is pro football, made one of the worst decisions to go back to school that we've seen in quite some time. Went in the fifth round. Dalen Hayes, the edge from Notre Dame. And then Ben Mason, fullback from Michigan in the fifth round. So that's who they went. Let's start with their first round picks, Bateman and Owe. And what you thought of those two guys, Emery? Well, Bateman is someone that was like they needed. They needed some some additional help at wide receiver. Um, you know, Bateman is someone I think catches the football really well. I don't think he's that dynamic or explosive, um, but I do think he has really good hands. And to me, if you have those great hands and can catch anything, I don't I don't too much care about everything else. We could figure out things else. We could find ways to create opportunities for you to get open, but. I need for you to catch the football, and he definitely does that. And and when you look at um, Owe, this is this to me shows you that this is not an uh, Ozzy Newsom pick. This is more of the the Casa pick, or you know the the new guy that's that's over uh, in Baltimore, or new guys in charge. And you know because usually the Ravens are all in on production, so I fully expect this to be a guy, let's say like a Joe Tryon or someone that had productive uh sack numbers at in college now granted previous year he had five and a half sacks in rotation amongst stars which is outstanding and this year he had zero sacks and it's harder to sell the zero sacks but if anyone could make it work it's probably baltimore when you give someone that has the athletic traits they can teach him up on the technique they can put him in situations to where he can be disruptive and productive so it made sense from a team perspective. Not every team could take Owe uh, coming off what he did last season or this past season, but the Baltimore Ravens could. Out of some of their other picks, Emery, which ones jump out to you? It's interesting. I don't know that Ben Cleveland would have been a third-round pick for some teams, but uh, you know he is a gigantic human being, and he fits what the Ravens really want to do with this heavy gap scheme, you know, knocking people off the ball. I mean, that's what Ben Cleveland should be able to do. And then obviously the ones that jump out to you are getting guys like Wallace and Wade later on in the draft where, you know, at different points, those guys were thought of as as at worst day two guys. Right. And early in the, let's say in the way too early 2021 NFL draft mock drafts that you saw right after the 2020 draft, both Wallace and Wade were in the first round. Um, and the Ravens got both of those guys. Wallace, I've said this before, I thought he was 6'3", 215 by how he played, but so surprised that he was measured in the same size as uh, Rashad Bateman, who seemed like he was 6'2", 204, but both guys are six feet 190, but both have tremendous hands. Um, and when you look at someone like Wade, again, not everybody can choose Wade and have him be successful. Baltimore, you feel like, all right, they'll find a way to get him back into the same rhythm that had people thinking very highly of his game. You're absolutely right. He made the worst decision of going back to school because all it did was just bring his game down a peg. Keep an eye out for Dale and Hayes out of Notre Dame. When you watch him play, you're like, man, this guy has potential as a blitzer. I love how aggressive he was coming off the edge. And Ben Cleveland and, and and Ben Mason, those are Baltimore Ravens picks. So they're going to find their way to be productive. But Brandon Stevens was another interesting one because he was a tremendous tailback at UCLA, wanted to make the switch to cornerback and bought all in on that position switch and went to SMU. 
and looked phenomenal. You know, you go and watch the North Texas game and you watch his how easy he is in transition. He has the athleticism and being a former offensive player is not surprised by the ball being in the air coming his way. It's almost like he's back in that offensive mode and he attacks it at his highest point and make plays on the ball. So I like that pick too for Baltimore. I didn't know that, Emery. Brandon Stevens was a UCLA running back and he transferred to SMU to play. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was outstanding at tailback at UCLA and, and bought into the position switch. And so when you look at him from that prism, the upside is tremendous. And he was able to, you know, he's able to run with anybody. He's able to transition really well. He's fluid. He's athletic. He's agile, being a former running back. And now playing cornerback with the same offensive mindset makes it a very intriguing pick. Let's move on to the Cincinnati Bengals now, Emery. And they went Jamar Chase in the first round, Jackson Carmen, the big guard from Clemson, in round two, Joseph Osai, the edge rusher from Texas, round three. They had three fourth-round picks, Cameron Sample from Tulane, Tyler Shelvin, LSU, Deontay Smith from East Carolina, in the fifth round, they took a kicker. Man, he better be good. Evan McPherson from Florida. Sixth round, Trey Hill from Georgia. And then sixth round, Chris Evans, the running back from Michigan. Seventh round, Wyatt Hubert, the D end from K-State. What did you think of them taking Chase as opposed to Sewell, since that's what so many people talk about? You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, they did a great job in the 2020 draft doing what I call the two for one. You get two essentially first round players, um, you know, with, you know, you kind of get, you get a first round pick and you get the top of the second round picks. So I call that two first round picks, uh, like a two for one special, but and he did a great job last year with Burrow and then T Higgins. So I'm like, all right, if you're not going to take the offensive lineman, they picked high enough in the second round to get a very good offensive line. We saw some great offensive linemen go off the board in the middle part of the second round. So I was like, all right, they can, you know, kind of have their cake and eat it too by taking Chase and then taking a very good uh, lineman in the, at the top of the second. But they traded down and they took Carmen. That's the biggest issue I have with what they did. I don't care about Chase. Chase is going to be tremendous. They could have taken any lineman, in, you know, at five, and he would have been tremendous. But so I'm not worried about them taking Chase. I just have an issue with them trading down from such a higher second round pick and taking a guy that, that, you know, still needs a little bit more grooming uh, as opposed to getting a for sure plug and play guy. Let's say like a Brady Christian higher in the second round, as opposed to letting someone like Carolina get him. I think that's where they whiffed on the, their chance to do what they did in 2020. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, Carmen, that, that was surprising to me that he went that high. They're reportedly moving him to guard. We'll see. Uh, I don't know that he ever really reached his potential at Clemson. Uh, so what about their middle round picks? Uh, Osai, Sample, Shelvin, Deontay Smith. I like some of these guys. Yeah, I, I listen, I thought they knocked it out the park in the fourth round. Sample, I've been on record on this show and saying that, you know, that's a guy that reminds me so much of Melvin Ingram with how aggressive he is coming off the ball, complaining we're up, up front. Tyler Shelvin was my number two nose tackle it, it's impossible to move him off the spot so whoever's blocking him is not going to have a good day at all because you're not going to move him he is like stuck right there at the point of attack and Deonta Smith quite honestly it was a sleepy sleeper underrated type pick this dude is outstanding athletically and he bulked up a little bit from the time we saw him earlier in the season at ECU um to, to you know to the time he got to the senior ball I believe he added some weight, and this is a dude that really got some game, man. And I think they got themselves a potential starter uh, in the fourth round. So I thought they knocked out the park with all those fourth round picks. Any thoughts on the late round guys? McPherson, Hill, Evans, Hubert? No, but as an undrafted free agent, they got Puka Williams, who I think is a one to one to what they had in Gio Bernard. And I see Puka Williams making that roster as an undrafted free agent. Also keep an eye out for Darius Hodge, too. A tremendous player uh, coming from Marshall. That defense was outstanding. Hodge is one of those guys that can pressure, he can blitz, and also is a very good run defender. So I thought they did a good job as an undrafted free agent territory as well. 
you know, it's interesting to me, like a guy like Chris Evans from Michigan going ahead of Jarrett Patterson or getting drafted where guys, I, I don't know. Uh, Trey Hill is a powerful center. So they got, they got a center, they got a guard, they got a tackle. Um, you know, Carmen's the one you would expect to play sooner rather than later. What did you think of Chris Evans? I like his uh, elusiveness and I, you know, I love, you know, uh, throwing out comps, right? But this dude reminded me so much of Amp Lee when I watched him run because it, it speed wise is not the most explosive or dynamic. But from a, an elusive standpoint, he's making dudes miss consistently. And it's just, it looks awesome uh, when you watch it real time because he has a good dead leg. He has a good, uh, you know, shiftiness. And when he shifts his weight from left to right to make a guy miss. And so he has elusiveness. And he has very good vision. And, you know, if you compile all of his, uh, you know, seasons at Michigan, you get one good year. So, because it, it was kind of disjointed. You know, he missed a year. They kind of played sporadically. But, Every time he played, he was being productive. So I like the player. Um, and in the sixth round, you have no no qualms about it. But I love his elusiveness. Let's get to the Cleveland Browns. And uh, the Browns had a, a pretty good draft, I thought. You know, you get Greg Newsom in the first round. And a lot of people thought they were going to take Jeremiah Owusu-Koromoa there. They get him in the second round, pick 20. 52 overall he evidently had some heart issues which is that popped up late in the process which is why he fell like he did round three anthony schwartz the wide receiver from auburn round four james hudson the tackle from cincinnati uh, the other round four pick tommy togiai from ohio state the d tackle round five they took tony field the linebacker from west virginia and Richard LeCount, an Emory Hunt favorite, the safety from Georgia. And then in round six, they took Demetric Felton, another UCLA running back that's playing a different position. He's listed as a wide receiver. So a lot there. Let's start, though, with their first two picks, Newsom and Owusu Koromoa. Nailed those two defensive picks. Newsom is a press guy, uh, physical, annoys the hell out of wide receivers which is exactly what you want at that position. They needed depth and talent uh, infused at that cornerback position. Well, you know, you, you don't know what you're going to get from a health perspective from Greedy Williams. You hope he comes back 100%. It just makes you stronger with Ward, Williams, and now Newsom. So they needed to add someone there, and they got a really good one in Greg Newsom. And Awusu Kormor is someone that is going to be a matchup defender. So he's a game day specific matchup player. Some days you may have him out in coverage. Some games, the matchup may dictate, okay, we're just going to use you solely as a blitzer. Some days we're going to have you play more of a, of a whip role. Um, some days you're going to have you're going to have you playing inside backer as a nickel backer. So I like the fact that they get that position versatility with someone that can do a lot of different things on defense. Tell me about Schwartz in the third round. Much better pro player than he was in college because he's going to be uh, you know, getting better quarterback play from Baker Mayfield as opposed to Bo Nix. And it's not a knock on Bo Nix. It's just that it's just the fact that Baker Mayfield uh, can consistently get him the ball and take advantage of what he brings to the table. But almost initially, he's your stud kickoff and punt returner. He's going to be utilizing a wide receiver run game. He's your most explosive player on offense because he's a legitimate track and field runner. Um, and it kind of helps you ease a guy like Odell Beckham back into the mix. Not saying he's a one-to-one -to, -one to Odell Beckham, but now you don't have to press and get Odell Beckham out there right away coming off the ACL. You can kind of ease him into it to where he feels comfortable, but you gain uh, Odell Beckham's explosiveness with a guy like Anthony Schwartz. So I love the pick, and I love the player as well, because, again, when you have legitimate speed, it changes everything. We see how that it works out in Kansas City with Tyreek Hill. The fourth round picks, Hudson from Cincinnati. I know people liked him. And Togiai from Ohio State, that dude was pretty dominant in uh, towards the end of the year and certainly in the FC in, in the playoffs. Two workmanlike effort type players. Uh, Hudson gives effort consistently. He's a whistle to whistle guy, um, snap to whistle guy. And you look at Togiai, you know, he just he's just a productive player, just kind of finds ways to be productive, you know, and it just, he gets off blocks. He chases the, the runaway, um, you know, 
Tim Crumry, uh, you know, the old Bengals defensive line, yeah. kind of reminds me of Togiai. We, we're teaching people here about football because a lot of people think football just started in 2003. But no, it has <laughs> always been around. And there have been some really good players that people need to know about. And I think Togiai reminds me a lot of Crumry and what he does up there up front. I just like the effort and the, the, the fact that he doesn't give up on a down, another snap to whistle type guy. You know, Crumry was a D line coach in Buffalo when I was there. That guy's a maniac, absolute maniac. Um, late round guys, Fields, LeCount, and Felton. What do you got? I got nothing on those guys. I don't know anything about those guys. I don't think we ever talked about those guys. <laughs> but now, nah, all jokes aside, you know, I'm all in on LeCount. Um, was number two free safety for me. Uh, every time you look up, he has the ball in his hands. I don't care. He ran a four nine. Um, when you when you're able to be that productive, uh, running that speed, that tells me your instincts, awareness, football IQ is exactly where it needs to be because you know your speed, but and so you know what you have to do to get yourself in position to make plays, and he's always done that. And I just think he had a bad day testing wise. I think he's a phenomenal football player, much better than what he tested at at his pro day. Um, and then you look at Fields. Fields is a very good linebacker, solid linebacker. Probably was going to start initially as a core special team, but I love the fact that he was able to be a very good defender on a West Virginia defense that was low key very good um, defensively this season uh, in, in 2020. And then you look at uh, the last guy we talked, you, you brought up uh, Felton. I think he played running back like a wide receiver, um, but when he went out to wide receiver, now he has to get beat coverage from cornerback. So I think he's kind of in you know that position purgatory where you want to see him, uh, you know, kind of do both things. And I, just like Core Moore or Wusu Core Moore, he's going to be a matchup piece on game day. Today, you may have to be more of a receiver. The next game, we may need you more as a scat back as opposed to a receiver. So giving yourself position flexibility and versatility helps you maximize the 53-46 on game day. The FCS playoffs might be over, Emery. But it's playoff time. NBA, NHL, get fired up. Bigger stakes, bigger promotions. Time to hammer the over and score some cash. DraftKings Sportsbook is giving you a chance to lower the over under on a featured playoff game. All players who place a bet on the featured basketball game will have a hand in lowering the over-under on the game. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code ROSS when you sign up to hammer the over. For every 1,500 people that bet the over in the feature game, the line will decrease by a point. So, yeah, what do you need to do? You need to make sure you tell your friends and family, spread it on social media, team effort, hammer the over, and improve your odds of doubling your money. Just make sure you use the promo code ROSS, limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. All right, last but certainly not least, Emery, let's get to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And their first two picks, Najee Harris in the first round, Pat Fryermuth in the second round. We kind of talked about this a few weeks ago. You laughed that the Steelers turn in their cards. They make their picks, you know, before the draft even happens. A lot of people had them mocked taking Najee Harris in the first round, like almost everybody. And a lot of people had them taking Frymuth in the second, too. I mean, it, it was – that was by far the number one mocked correct first two picks. It, football is not that hard, man. It's not that complicated. Find good players, take good players, play with good players, and you tend to win most of your games. That's the Pittsburgh Steeler mantra and philosophy, and it's been tried and true since Ben. You know what I'm saying? So it's like every time we look up, the Steelers are finding good players. So for me, it's a plug-and-play situation. Um, they're excellent now at tight end and at running back, and I just think those two picks will be guys that we'll see on all rookie teams by the time the season is over with. People wanted them to take an offensive lineman earlier after that group's disappointing year up front. They didn't do it till round three. Kendrick Green 
who, by the way, they announced as a guard and not a center, which I thought was interesting. Then they came back and took Dan Moore Jr. in the fourth round. What do you know about those two guys? Green is athletic, so I can understand why they want to see him as a guard. Uh, however, you know, they have Dotson already there that they drafted last year, tremendous uh, offensive lineman from the great University of Louisiana. And they also have the Castro. So guard, they're straight. Now at center is where you think you're going to see green. But, you know, and I kind of want athletic guys like that that's so quick off the ball. You, you, you like, obviously you like them at guard. But, man, imagine the possibilities at center. Now you open up your entire playbook to, to move your center in the run game. Uh, you move him in, in pass pro. Uh, so I, I could see him playing both. But I think his athleticism and his quickness is what kind of yielded him getting drafted high. And, and more, you know, you come up from a, a very good off, offensive line at Texas a and a kind of well-balanced player does a solid job in pass pro as he does in the run game. You saw them, you know, pave the way for Isaiah Spiller, who we talk about next year uh, as a tremendous tailback coming from Texas A&M. We saw what Kellen Mond was able to do uh, throwing a football. And so I think they got themselves good depth and uh, a guy in green that has starter potential down the line. He may even compete earlier than than people expect him to. Uh, at center, but I, at guard, I just see that's a long road for him uh, to try to crack that lineup. What did you think of their edge guys? Uh, round five, Louder Milks, not a guy I knew a whole lot about from Wisconsin. And then I always kind of like Quincy Roche, the uh, six round pick from Miami, who used to be at Temple. I'm a little surprised. I think I guess he got overshadowed by those other guys, but pretty productive to go in the sixth round. Yeah, he was so productive at both spots. You, you saw him routinely make plays uh, at Miami, and you obviously saw him just make every dog on play defensively uh, at Temple. So, again, Pittsburgh got themselves a guy in the sixth round that is going to end up making some defensive all rookie team because he's going to be a, a hired assassin as far as being a pass rusher is concerned, which is right up his alley. And Lotto Milk is, is a point of attack guy, depth guy. I probably going to end up playing a five up front. Uh, for them, you know, in you know, coming from Wisconsin, by nature of what he was doing defensively, he's going to be a strong point of attack player as a result. Last three guys I should ask you about: Buddy Johnson, linebacker from A and M; Trey Norwood, a corner they took from Oklahoma. And uh, do you have anything to say about your boy Presley Harvin, the punter from Georgia Tech that they <laughs> took in the seventh round? He better be able to score, you know, because again. You're taking draft picks, uh, kickers and punters. And this is not a knock on kickers, punters, and long snappers. But, man, you, I could let you guys sign after the draft and compete because there's a bunch of those for, for one or two spots. So I wouldn't waste draft unless you can automatically score points. Uh, like if you're a punter that can consistently down the ball inside the one, then I'm not taking you. If you're a kicker that can make kicks from anywhere on the field, I'm not taking you. You know, so – I wouldn't take a, a specialist like that unless they can score um, consistently. Now, as far as the undrafted guys, first of all, Norwood is a really good corner um, that they're going to try to see as a safety. So he can kind of play both, gives them some depth, core special teamer, gunner type guy. But look at Pittsburgh at receiver. And I'm looking at the roster. Isaiah McCoy from Kent State, who's phenomenal. Rico Bussy, who was at Hawaii. He was at North Texas and he transferred out to Hawaii. Explosive. And both guys do a great job of tracking the football. So they are trying to legitimately work touchdown to check down the passing game. I love those two picks. Mark Gilbert is another undrafted free agent out of Duke um, that can play corner or safety. So they get someone that has versatility. And I like the fact that they didn't go quarterback in this draft because I think Pittsburgh feels as though they can see what they have in Dwayne Haskins, who they got for you know peanuts on the dollar, and let him compete with um, – uh, Mason Rudolph and see if they have something there. If not, then hey, 2022, they can go into that quarterback market, whatever that market may look like uh, in the draft. But I think they did a good job of filling some gaps in their roster and they have some opportunities, some guys that are undrafted free agents that have a good chance of making the roster. Next week, we got the AFC South as we continue to go through every team, including your team's draft. You can always check out the other episodes over at youtube.com 
slash Ross Tucker NFL. Please subscribe. Check out those videos. Check out Emory football game plan on YouTube or at F ball game plan on social media. I'm at Ross Tucker NFL. We are at Ross Tucker pod. Really looking forward to the AFC South next week. Some interesting selections in that division. Other than that, the keg is kicked. We are all tapped out. Thanks for listening to the College Draft Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, Fantasy Feast, Even Money, and The Business of Sports. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found. A lot of times on the show, I mention DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100 Gambler or in Indiana, 1-800-9 with it. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, it doesn't always, sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in site credit.